Hey there, Christopher Yuan. I know you and your legal team are watching. Just a reminder, this video exists for the purpose of criticism and is legally protected under fair use. Attempting to have this video erased through false copyright strikes is actually a criminal offense, and you would not be the first Christian ministry to try and fail to use criminal activity and intimidation to try to shut down my criticism. I hope you enjoyed the video! Having been raised in the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, I grew up hearing an intentionally one-sided narrative about sex and gender. Being gay is wrong. It's a result of the fall of man. It's a distortion of how God created us to be. You can choose not to be gay. If you're attracted to the same sex or want to dress like another gender, that's a result of demonic influence and perversion of God's design. Everyone is much happier and healthier when they refuse to give in to those sinful urges, and God can make you stop feeling them entirely if you have faith in him. Through homeschooling, church attendance, and sheltering from worldly influences, I rarely, if ever, heard any other perspectives on the topic until college. To clarify, my university itself was conservative evangelical and reinforced the narrative with which I was raised. It wasn't until the end of my undergrad in psychology and the beginning of my grad level work in psychology that I encountered academic work which contradicted that narrative. Yeah, my university required all students to attend an hour-long chapel service three times a week, so regardless of what you studied, you were fed a steady diet of propaganda. A few years ago, I made a video about this experience and spoke specifically about the school's narratives about sexuality. Countless times, the curriculum for my psychology degree at this university reinforced the idea that personal anecdotes, lacking any controls against confounding factors, served as less reliable data points than observations made within an experimentally controlled environment. Meanwhile, the university proudly ignored all research on sexual orientation in favor of the anecdotes of evangelists who claimed to have turned straight by the grace of God. In fact, the university even had Christopher Yuan, a so-called ex-gay Christian evangelist, speak in one of our chapel services while I was there. He told us the story of how he found Jesus while he was in prison and subsequently stopped living as a gay man. We students were expected to see him as evidence for the claim that God can change our sexual orientation. Because, you know, personal testimony is all we should need to believe that huge claim. However, during the Q&A which followed his presentation, a student asked a question which should have had an easy answer if God truly was in the business of turning people straight. The student asked, Now that you've come to God, are you sexually attracted to women? Christopher's answer? No. His answer had most of the audience looking around at each other in confusion. After several seconds of silence, he asked for the next question and just moved on. It was obvious, even with all of his talk of God's power over sin, the reality was that he had simply chosen to be celibate. So we at this academic institution were expected to forego any consideration of scientific research on sexual orientation in favor of a narrative which we were told was supported by anecdotes of great Christians, but was in reality still not supported by the experience of the most accomplished ex-gay evangelist to which we had access. Quickly after I posted that video, Christopher Yuan himself responded to me, saying that my video misrepresented him. If you've heard my testimony, I verily, you know, never talked about that I've turned straight. I mean, I'm not even dating anyone. So, you know, I would say someone who turns straight is someone who's maybe married, has children. That obviously isn't part of my story. I also don't ever use the word celibate. I, I think that that's fraught with problems. I do talk about that I'm, I'm single, but I always talk about in the context of that I pursue holy sexuality, which is when I'm single, I'm going to be chaste. When I'm married, and I'm using Jesus' definition of marriage, man and a woman, Mark chapter 10 and Matthew 19, then I'm going to be faithful of my spouse. So I think, you know, what when people ask me, do I still have attractions? You know, I, I, I put, this is what I normally say, I put in the context of, well, all of us, you know, just simply because I might still have attractions or temptations doesn't then mean then that I am a certain way or, you know, first of all, I don't identify as gay. I don't think that that's an appropriate 
term for myself. Not to say that I'm straight, though, and that's, you know, that's that's the confusion. I think that's both of those categories are problematic. I, to date, have never used that phrase, ex-gay. As a matter of fact, in my testimony, I even say that I don't identify as ex-gay. So there is a little, you know, quite clear misrepresentation. I mean, again, I don't I don't know where that where I spoke at, and if there's a recording that we can check on, you know, most likely <laughs> we, there isn't. But I would never have. Well, said I am ex-gay. For the record, it's true. Christopher Yuan never called himself ex-gay or claimed to be straight. He said that as a result of his faith, he stopped living as a gay man. It was my university which called him ex-gay and implied that he had turned straight. When I first heard his response, I thought. You know, this is just splitting hairs about language instead of actually dealing with my points about anecdotal evidence and sexual orientation change efforts. But something happened recently that changed my perspective here. Christopher Yuan began popping up all over Christian media to promote a new project. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Christopher Yuan about the Holy Sexuality Project. The Holy Sexuality Project video series. He has created a new curriculum called the Holy Sexuality Project. My name is Christopher Yuan, and I have created a 12 lesson video curriculum designed just for you, the parent, to watch at home with your teenager. I will share my own testimony of having identified as a gay man and now no longer do. I will also tell some anecdotes and stories, but the bulk of these 250 minutes of teaching will be grounded in the Word of God. Yeah, it's a curriculum for kids taught by Christian fundamentalist Christopher Yuan, teaching a revised version of the narrative I was taught growing up. Even with how visible LGBT people are in the mainstream today, this stuff is still very popular, as evidenced by the fact that this series was crowdfunded to the tune of $1.2 million. This actually was a $1.2 million project because there was high quality animation from animators, illustrators, artists from the Bible Project. So very, very expensive. We fortunately didn't pay that much, but our donors wanted so much for every Christian family to have one at home that it, this should cost $200, $300 per license for a two-year license. Our donors are actually offering it for $20. Yes, lucky for me, I only had to spend $20 on the curriculum in order to complete every single lesson. I did definitely learn something from it, especially the purpose of Yuan's extremely specific language. See, the video series does not directly contend with the body of scientific research upheld by basically all major health organizations worldwide, which show sexual orientation to be naturally diverse that same-sex attraction and relationships do not in themselves lead to negative outcomes, and that any attempt to change or just suppress sexual orientation is known to be both harmful and ineffective. Instead, this series relies entirely on narrative. Yuan uses stories to get his points across, and the precise language he uses is an integral part of this storytelling. So, let me take you through this curriculum and show you how this is done. To keep this brief, I'll just hit a bunch of highlights in the series. Along the way, I'll share my thoughts as someone who is educated by people like Yuan, but left the fundamentalist perspective after receiving formal education on the subject. At the end, you can decide whether or not Yuan is really giving his students the whole story on sex and gender. Religion is, in large part, a tradition of storytelling, which seeks to shape the values of listeners. When a story has utility like that, many people tend to compete to tell it in a way which shapes society as they see fit. Take this huge story about Louisiana's new law requiring the Ten Commandments to be displayed in classrooms. Over 300 articles have been published on it, which I think proves my point. I found this story where I read all of my news on Ground News, a news aggregator app and website I use to get the full story. I actually do use Ground News every day, and it's why I continue to work with them as a sponsor on my channel. Go find out for yourself why I like them so much by going to ground.news slash skeptic. The link is in the description. Let's take a closer look at this story and compare coverage to see how folks are competing over the narrative. This headline openly scorns the 1980 Supreme Court ruling which deemed requiring displays of the Ten Commandments in public schools to be unconstitutional. 
This likely serves to trigger partisan interest in the article. Meanwhile, this headline refers to the relevant political conflict in this story, but in much more neutral language, promising a more even-handed look at the issue. Small differences in phrasing and news headlines can influence public perception to go in very different directions and thus shape society's values in all sorts of ways. Ground News provides tools that greatly help us readers remain aware of bias in news coverage so we can get properly informed every time we read the news. Go to ground.news skeptic to try a better way to read the news. Subscribe through my link for 40% off unlimited access to the Vantage subscription, which is what I use. With so many people competing for our attention and allegiance, we've got to check our biases and see all sides. Luckily, Ground News makes that easy, so go support my favorite sponsor, which supports my channel in the process. Okay, now on to the video series. Please remember that I will be skipping over quite a bit for the sake of time. There will be edits in the clips that I have cut out. There are three videos in every lesson, and we'll start with some highlights in lesson one, video one, where Yuan tells his story of coming out of his identity as a gay man and into a new identity in Christ. In my early 20s, I moved away from home and came out of the closet, announcing to the world, I am gay. At that point, I believed that my sexuality was my main core identity. I decided to go home and break the news to my parents, and I told them, I am gay. It was my declaration. My mom gave me an ultimatum to choose the family or choose that, but for me, this wasn't a choice, and I said, if you can't accept me, I have no other choice but to leave. So I left. Amazingly, God used that crisis to bring my mother to saving faith in Jesus, and soon after, my father believed as well. However, I went in the total opposite direction. I spent most of my free time in the gay clubs, and I went from relationship to relationship and began experimenting with drugs, but to be clear, not all gay men do drugs. I'm just telling my story, not anyone else's. Not only was I doing drugs, but I was selling drugs. It's good that he clarified so kids don't get the impression that gay people are all dealers or addicts or something. Although, there is another reason why he likely felt the need to clarify this. Self-described ex-gay Christian figures of the past have made it a point to emphasize their supposedly depraved lifestyle of drug addiction before miraculously changing through the love of Christ. This intentionally painted a picture of LGBT people as inherently less healthy and moral than cishet people. Several of the ex-gay figures who did this, like John Polk of Love One Out and Exodus International Ministries, and Jeffrey McCall of Freedom March, have since fallen from grace, admitting that their claims about not being queer anymore and being able to turn other people straight were false. Christopher Yuan's career does not exist in a cultural vacuum. The primarily Christian ex-gay industry has repeatedly cycled through explosive growth and explosive self-destruction for decades, and Yuan is well aware of that. But not one of the hundreds of people we counseled ever became straight. Instead, many of our clients began to fall apart, sinking deeper into patterns of guilt, anxiety, and self-loathing. Why weren't they changing? The answers from church leaders made the pain even deeper. Well, you might not be a real Christian. You don't have enough faith. You're not praying and reading the Bible enough. Maybe you have a demon. The message always seemed to be, you're not enough. As one current Exodus leader admitted, we were just Christians with homosexual tendencies who would rather not have those tendencies. By calling ourselves ex-gay, we were lying to ourselves and to others. We were hurting people. To distance himself from the countless failed ministries which preached that gay people can change, Yuan has to be careful not to clumsily repeat some of their most common talking points. All right, the next clip is long, but it's important to understand Yuan's story and how his beliefs formed. Bear with me, I think this will be the longest clip that I show in the entire video. She knew that it was going to take nothing short of a miracle. 
to bring this prodigal son to the father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. I open up my door and on my doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, police officers, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated all my money and the drugs I had, which the court noted was equivalent to 9.1 tons of marijuana. With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I had started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in jail. Three days later, I was walking around the cell block. As I passed the garbage can, I thought, this is my life. My parents worked hard to provide for all my needs and more. My dad had two doctorates. I was just three months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made. But now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. With my head down, I was about to pass by this garbage can, but Something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, I picked it up, and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell and I opened it up. And for the first time, I read through the entire Gospel of Mark that night. But I wasn't thinking, this is the answer. I just thought I've got an enormous amount of time on my hands and a better pass it somehow. But as some of you know, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper, but what we have, my friends, is the very Word of God. It is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion, and it wasn't a pretty sight, and I thought things couldn't get worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called to see the nurse. I was handcuffed and I shuffled into her office, wrestling with the words. The nurse wrote something on a piece of paper and slowly slid it across the desk to me. I looked down and I saw three letters and a symbol. It read HIV positive. I had contracted the human immunodeficiency virus, which today still has no cure. This virus led to the death of many of my close gay friends. The days after were dark and lonely. I was sentenced to six years, better than 10 years to life, but news of my HIV status felt like a death sentence. One night I was laying in my bed and I looked up at the cold metal bunk above me. Someone had scribbled something. If you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You see, at the most hopeless point in my life, the Lord God was using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation, Judah, to tell me that if he can have a plan for Judah in rebellion, in exile, he can even have a plan for me. I can certainly empathize with Yuan here. When he was at the lowest point in his life, he felt the need to believe in something larger than himself, which promised salvation. That's understandable. That said, Yuan is telling his backstory in part in order to build a case for his credibility on issues of sexuality and spirituality. So the following point of mine must be made. People are much more impressionable and willing to believe falsehoods and fabrications when they are desperate for purpose, meaning, or direction. The fact that Yuan began adopting his religious beliefs when he was desperate does not point to the validity of those beliefs or to his rationality in adopting them. Stories of ideological transformation like this are huge red flags that the beliefs involved depend on irrationality for their acceptance. Such stories don't prove the beliefs irrational, but they do point to that likelihood. My transformation was gradual. God was convicting me of my idols, which were many. The most obvious was drugs, but within a few months, he delivered me from that addiction. 
It's a bit odd to me that he attributes his recovery from drug addiction to God's deliverance, because the physical aspect of drug addiction just goes away naturally if you don't use the drug for long enough. God's intervention isn't really required, that's just how our bodies work. Yuan was in prison and unable to access drugs, so his withdrawal symptoms and addiction going away were just a natural consequence. It's clear that where anyone else sees mundane natural processes, Yuan sometimes sees miracles. God kept bringing to mind other idols, and there was just this one thing that I felt like I just couldn't let go of, my sexuality. So I went to a chaplain and I asked him his opinion. And to my surprise, he told me he believed the Bible does not condemn same-sex relationships. He even gave me a book explaining that view. So with much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for same-sex relationships. I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. From a human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions were a clear distortion of God and his word. I couldn't even finish that book and I gave it back to the chaplain, which meant I turned to the Bible alone. In most circumstances, like say, in school, if a person reported on a book saying, I don't like the book and disagree with it, so I didn't finish it, one would be right to respond, how did you come to understand it enough to disagree with it so thoroughly if you didn't read it all? Then, if the person reasoned, I felt a spirit or God tell me it was wrong, one would be right to respond, can you demonstrate that what you felt was God and not just your own emotions? Of course, no student would get away with not doing a homework assignment using this excuse. I don't think Yuan's story should be treated any differently. A statement of essentially, I made up my mind before I actually understood other perspectives on the issue, is another red flag that one's position is not held rationally. Also, believers of other religions could just as easily say that their deity told them that a completely different set of beliefs is true, so this claim doesn't give Yuan's ideas any credibility. Implying it does is just special pleading, a common logical fallacy. I was at a turning point, a crossroads. Either abandon God and his word, live as a gay man by allowing my sexual attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived, or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship by freeing myself from my sexuality, by not allowing my desires to control who I was and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. By God's grace, I followed Jesus. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity should not be grounded in my desires. My identity is not gay. It's not ex-gay. It's not even heterosexual for that matter, because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. We'll revisit the idea of how identity is defined in a bit. So for now, I'll just point out his statement that his identity is not ex-gay. While this may be consistent with Yuan's specific theological notion of identity, we must realize that this maintains the narrative that he is distinct from the ex-gay movement. I apologize for my part in presenting a God of conditional love and ask forgiveness for the message of the broken truth that I spoke on behalf of Exodus. My heart breaks as I hear the many stories of abuse and suicide from men and women who couldn't change their orientation regardless of what Exodus and other Christian ministries told them. One of our own female attendees became so depressed over her inability to change that she jumped off a bridge rather than continue the struggle. One young man in our program got drunk and deliberately drove his car into a tree. Another fellow leader of the ex-gay movement told me that he had left Exodus and was now going to straight bars looking for guys to beat him up. He explained that the beatings, the beatings made him feel less guilty. He was atoning for his sin. 
Yeah, Yuan has good reason to try to say, I'm not like them, my beliefs are different. As we continue, we'll see Yuan consistently distance himself from the failed practices and debunked narratives of the ex-gay and conversion therapy movements. But will his claims be different enough to actually hold up? We'll see. As I began to live this life of surrender, God revealed his plan for my life. He called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison, of all places, and I realized it didn't matter where I was, whether I was in prison or out of prison, because my call to ministry would remain the same regardless of the location. With that change of heart, God shortened my prison sentence from six years to three years. With only about a year left of my prison sentence, I knew that I needed to learn more about the Bible. So I called my parents and asked them to mail me an application to Moody Bible Institute. Amazingly, I was actually accepted. I was released from prison in July of 2001, and I started the very next month. I graduated from Bible college in 2005, went on to get my master's in exegesis in 2007, and received my doctorate of ministry in 2014. And the year he graduated with his doctorate was the year he came to my university to speak. Now that we know his story, let's move on. I'm skipping videos two and three of lesson one because they primarily lay out the evangelical idea of attaining salvation, which I assume my audience is already pretty familiar with. So, on to lesson two. If there's one thing Christians miss when it comes to sexuality, they miss how much the world has confused sexuality to be an identity. In other words, people can't separate their sexual attractions from who they are. Many Christians think we must first convince our friends in the gay community of their sinful behavior. This is not unimportant, but before we address wrong actions, we must address identity. Because if our identity is wrong, then our starting point is wrong. When I was a teenager, my mom taught me a well-known Chinese proverb. Ta zi hao li, si zi qian li, which translates, a millimeter discrepancy leads to a thousand mile loss. This may seem like it's an exaggeration, but it rang true for one commercial flight that ended in a horrible tragedy. On August 31st, 1983, Korean Airlines Flight 007 departed New York City and was expected to land in Seoul, South Korea the next day. After refueling in Alaska, the pilots headed toward Korea, or so they thought. Somehow, the autopilot didn't engage properly and the plane veered from its route just a few degrees. This mistake initially put the aircraft astray a mere 12 miles in the first hour. However, as time progressed, it drifted further and further away from its planned course until five hours later, Flight 007 had entered into Russian airspace. Now, if this had occurred 10 years later in 1993, the Cold War would have been over and thus no problem. But this was in the midst of the Cold War and the US-Soviet relations were deteriorating yet again. Distrust and fear were high on both sides. We still don't know exactly all that transpired on that dark night in 1983, but what is certain is that a Russian fighter jet shot down this passenger aircraft, assuming it was an American spy plane. All 269 passengers and crew died when the airliner hit the water, all because the starting point was wrong. If you grew up in a church like mine, you know that this is a very common way to start off a sermon. Tell a gripping story of suspense and terror with a clear moral that, if followed, would have prevented a catastrophe. As a kid, this is the primary way fear of disobedience was drilled into me. While I did sometimes hear claims like, if you disobey or disagree with what the church says, you'll suffer torturous earthly consequences, that point was more often made by analogy, as was done here. Yuan is telling his intended audience of children and teenagers, if you don't define yourself the way I say, you will suffer, just like those people who died when their plane was shot out of the sky. 
This is a great way to motivate people, especially impressionable and fearful young people, to do and believe whatever you say. But it's not an ethical or intellectually honest way to do so. It's a scare tactic, plain and simple. For the young people watching me right now, this is yet another red flag that the person speaking does not rely on reason or evidence for their view or to convince others of it. Rather, it indicates that feeling fear is likely required for one to accept the points being made. When it comes to sexuality, we must make sure that our point of departure is not off. And that starting point is identity and correctly answering the question, who am I? Does sexuality truly describe our essence, that is, who we are? Or does sexuality only describe our experience, that is, what we do and what we desire? The answer should be obvious, but today it's not. As a matter of fact, I'm sure you know people who identify as gay, lesbian, trans, or something else. When they say, I am gay, they don't mean this is what I do or what I feel. They mean this is who I am. In other words, this is my essence, the core of my being. Maybe that's what some people mean. Others may attach their sexuality to their identity because it's an unchangeable, permanent characteristic of them which greatly influences how they experience the world, how they perceive and relate to others, how others perceive them, and how they perceive themselves. That's a pretty solid basis for identifying with your sexuality in some way. Now, Yuan might have formerly identified with his sexuality exclusively, just as he now exclusively identifies as a Christian, but not everyone goes to such an extreme. Most people acknowledge many different parts of their identity and don't uphold one characteristic as the only truly defining part of themselves. Identity is multifaceted, and I think most people realize that. Coming from a fundamentalist background, I think Yuan is doing something which fundamentalists are known to do in making their points. He's oversimplifying the issue of identity so that he can present it as a simple choice between two options. You can identify God's way, which is holy and sacred and beautiful and rational and perfect, or you can identify in a silly worldly way, which doesn't even make any sense in the first place. When I was a fundamentalist, I was taught to argue against evolution using a snappy comeback. See, here's the difference between you evolutionists and myself as a creationist. I believe in the beginning God, and you believe in the beginning dirt. This convinced no one I ever argued with, but it kept a teenage Drew believing that the issue was so simple that I couldn't be mistaken in what I thought was true, even though I didn't actually know much about the topic yet. I see the same kind of teaching as being used in this course. We will continue to explore the subject of identity, but for now, just be aware of how Yuan simplifies the complex topic in order to argue for his point of view. Where and when did this incorrect perspective originate? We need to go back and take a look at history, and we'll see how past secular philosophies have distorted our views on sexuality. Prior to the mid-1800s, people understood sexuality only as behavior, not identity. In fact, no word even existed to describe an individual with same-sex attractions. Sigmund Freud was a famous psychologist from the early 1900s. He believed people were completely driven and defined by their sexual desires. It was Freud who made mainstream the use of the terms heterosexual and homosexual. This labeled people according to categories based on their sexual and or romantic desires. Unlike his peers, Freud viewed homosexuality not as a sickness, but just as another variety of humanity. Thus, heterosexual and homosexual became new categories for the human race. Notice how Yuan starts with the belief that our view of sexuality has been distorted into an incorrect perspective. Then, he explains how Freud influenced the Western view of sexuality. This isn't an argument or explanation for why Freud's ideas are a distortion. Is it because all Western ideas or concepts created after 1800 are automatically false? Does he just think that old Austrian guys always lie? <laughs> Seriously, he hasn't given us any of his reasoning here. 
Of course, I know why Yuan did this. Kids are supposed to take this course with their very Christian, perhaps even fundamentalist, families, where the implication is that anything not found in the specific theological understanding of the Bible is automatically considered false and evil. Yuan doesn't have to directly make that point because children just understand it from the context. This is how I was taught about ideas from outside my religious community, and it made education difficult, to say the least. From here, Yuan continues to summarize some Western philosophical ideas relevant to identity, sexuality, and truth, presenting them for about a minute at a time and always as distortions of the truth. So how have past secular philosophies distorted our views on sexuality? They distorted sexuality to be who we are, when in fact, sexuality is what we feel and do. This is Yuan's main argument for why sexuality can't be an identity. It's just what we feel and do. Couldn't we make the same argument against identifying as a Christian, though? Christianity is just what you feel and do. You feel a connection to God during prayer and when you worship him. You read the Bible. You do devotionals. You seek his will. These are all just feelings and actions. That's all. That can't be your true identity. Of course, I would not actually say this because it's a bad argument. Yuan and anyone else can identify with their religion regardless of whether they conceptualize it as a state of being or a set of feelings and actions. Identity is all of those things. It's multifaceted, consisting of social, psychological, and existential elements. Any attempt to reduce it down, as Yuan does, simply fails to consider its true complexity, and does so to establish a self-serving narrative. What this all boils down to is this. Yuan does not want people to identify with their sexuality because he thinks any kind of queer thought or action is wrong, and if people accept that aspect of themselves as normal, permanent, or important to how they view themselves, it's much harder for him to convince them of his beliefs. As Christians, we believe in God. And the identity question is much easier to answer because the Bible is our foundation. Every facet of the world around us points to the intentional design and purpose of our Creator. And as our Creator, God is the only one who has the authority to define our identity and tell us who we are. As a fundamentalist kid, I heard this constantly. It's so hard being out in the world and wrestling with ideas so much. In here, it's easy because we have all the answers. The truth is so simple, and it comes from the ultimate authority in the universe. This is enticing to a lot of people, especially those who are uncomfortable with uncertainty or complexity. Personally, I'm not really that way, so I eventually came to see this selling point of fundamentalism as a serious flaw. As I grew up as a curious young person, I found more and more pieces of information that my fundamentalist authorities hadn't considered in forming their worldview. When I brought them up, I saw them find ways to brush off complexity and keep everything dubiously simple. Well, the scientists have their assumptions and we have ours, but ours are obviously better because they come from God. All that philosophy stuff just overcomplicates everything. It's simple. There are good guys and bad guys. There's lies and truth. There's God's ways, and then there are man's ways. All you need to know is what God says. Those Bible scholars bring up all their complicated interpretations and linguistic woo-woo to confuse us into disobeying God. Why do I need them when I can read exactly what God said right here in plain English? By the time I reached adulthood, a pattern was clear to me. In demanding simple answers to every question, the fundamentalist way of thinking must oversimplify and misrepresent most issues to derive such answers. This ultimately protects ignorance for the sake of comfort and rejects the humility and uncertainty required in a serious search for knowledge. Lastly, I should mention that one of the reasons the identity question is so hard for LGBT people is that religious fundamentalists make it hard for them on purpose. They scream at queer people, saying that they're lesser or broken or wrong if they innately think or experience the world differently than cishet people. Then, they say, 
But look at how much easier it is if you give up and conform to what we say about what you have to be. This is basically the age-old scam of inventing the disease and then selling the cure. It aims to chip away at queer people's self-confidence and social safety to the point where they must choose one of two options. Continue struggling against a powerful opposition without any help or confidence, or conform to the opposition's will and accept the self-worth and social support they allow you. When people get low enough, some, like Yuan himself, choose the latter option. Time for lesson three. On April 26, 2006, a Taylor University van with nine students hit a tractor trailer head on, killing five students. Four survived, but were in critical condition. One of the girls was in a coma, and because she looked similar to another girl in the van, the two were misidentified. Thus, one set of parents thought their daughter was alive in a coma when she really did not survive. Another set of parents buried who they thought was their daughter, but their actual daughter was fighting for her life in the hospital. It took five weeks before they finally realized this huge error. A false identity can have huge consequences. That's right, kids. Being gay isn't just like being violently shot out of the sky by Soviet missiles. It's also like getting knocked into a coma during a brutal car crash and causing your family incredible pain and confusion. Seriously, do we really need two different vehicle crash stories? I mean, if you're going to use scare tactics, you could at least mix it up and, I don't know, tell us about the freaky stuff you think demons are going to do to us in hell or something. I mean, that would at least be more entertaining. When Genesis 1 verse 27 says that we are made in God's image, it's describing who we are as a whole. It's our identity, our essence. To the core, we're created in the image of God. Therefore, when we view anything else as the core of our being and put our identity in anything other than God, especially our sexuality, we are in fact rejecting and trying to replace God's image with a false identity. This is just more storytelling. Can we demonstrate this core identity in some way? Can we observe our essence? Is this what the authors of Genesis even intended to communicate? Is Genesis even divinely authoritative in the way Yuan treats it in the first place? Why does this narrative have more of a claim on objective truth than any other way of thinking about identity? Again, kids are supposed to watch this while surrounded by family who teaches them to presuppose answers to all of these questions. All Yuan has to do is imply that God said something and it's treated as unquestionably true. From the outside looking in, though, we can see that all he's doing is making unsubstantiated claims wrapped in the pretty package of narrative. Next up, Yuan lists some truths about being made in the image of God. Third, being male or female is linked to being created in God's image. Genesis 1 verse 27 conveys an undeniable connection between the image of God and the objective categories of male and female. Let's take a careful look at this verse. Genesis 1 verse 27 actually consists of three parallel lines of poetry. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In the first parallel line of poetry, we have the subject, God, then the verb created, then the direct object, man, and lastly, the prepositional phrase in his own image. So it is subject, verb, object, prepositional phrase. In the second parallel line of poetry, we begin with the prepositional phrase in the image of God, then the subject, he, the verb created, and lastly, the direct object, him. The first and second lines say exactly the same thing, just in a different order. In the third parallel line of poetry, instead of beginning with, in the image of God, the author replaces the phrase with male and female. Did you catch that? The author replaces, in the image of God, with male and female. This communicates that there is a close connection between being created in the image of God and being male and female. What does all this mean? 
just as being created in the image of God is physical, spiritual, and essential to being human, being male or female is physical, spiritual, and essential to who we are. So we've talked about all the presuppositions Yuan and his intended audience bring in here, which makes anything in Genesis prescriptive and authoritative. Now can we appreciate how when you bring in those presuppositions, your authoritative proof for why it's wrong to be trans is literally a poem? <laughs> to us outsiders, this is as reasonable as getting mad at people for having a career and citing the Epic of Gilgamesh to prove that we must actually all try to be immortal god kings instead. Talk about relying on storytelling. Literary interpretation is a subjective process, and poetry especially allows for a huge diversity of reasonable interpretations. Interpreting a text requires a person to impose meaning onto words, phrases, literary structure, etc. And all of that meaning is determined by the subjective internal processes of every mind which engages in interpretation. In short, you cannot make an objective statement or argument like this from your interpretation of a line of text. Perhaps especially a poem. Yuan does not engage with any scientific understanding of gender or sexual orientation here, but he does treat ancient poetry as if it prescribes a specific scientific understanding of gender or sexual orientation. This is the classic fundamentalist move of oversimplifying the issue to the point of treating one interpretation of one passage in one chapter of one book as all one needs to know about an extremely complex topic. And regardless of whether a person experiences same-sex attractions or opposite sex attractions, everyone is created in the image of God. It's inherent to who we are and is never erased. When we say that every person should be treated with dignity and respect, it's not because of our commitment to social justice and human rights. It's because we're all created in the image of God. Every person is endowed with inestimable value and should be treated with dignity and respect. The image of God is the only true foundation for justice. This is a line of reasoning I was taught to justify the conservative evangelical political idea that a state's laws and rights should be determined entirely by my religious group's specific theology. While we didn't use this term when I was a kid, it was a Christian nationalist idea. It's intentionally delivered in a way which focuses on loving and valuing everyone, which is what enticed me as a young person. Eventually, I learned some religious and political history and realized that, even for Christians, this was a dangerous idea. After the Protestant Reformation began, Europe became enveloped in the Thirty Years' War, also called the Wars of Religion. Catholics and Protestants, who both believed they had a claim on the only true foundation for justice in God's true will, killed each other in a struggle for power. This lasted for decades, as the name suggests, and left an estimate upwards of 10 to 12 million dead. This is one of the reasons the founding fathers of my country, the US, chose a different basis for law and order than religion. It was clear that when one religious dogma ruled, others were persecuted. Talking through conflict became impossible in a regime which dealt in such absolutes, so violence was inevitable. Later, just after World War II, great thinkers from all over the world honed in on the ideal of universal human rights. Their hope was to create a way of thinking that might prevent people who think they have a claim to total moral superiority from gaining power and hurting people. I think this was a good project. The concept of human rights allows religious and non-religious people to meet on a kind of neutral ground. Regardless of where exactly we think justice is grounded, at least we can agree on some things that we can all observe to make life better for everyone. Meanwhile, Yuan's idea is that we should not let those who disagree with us live as they see fit because only his religious group has a claim on the true foundation for justice. Imagine for a moment that the country did adopt this mentality. With total political control stemming from state theology, all it would take for fundamentalists like Yuan to be persecuted would be for state theology to come to disagree with them. Yuan would not be able to reason with the state, he'd be a deplorable heretic worthy of damnation his own political idea would ultimately prevent him from practicing his own religion in peace. Yuan might be smiling, talking about loving and valuing all people, 
but that doesn't make his anti-human rights teachings any less authoritarian. And given that he's talking to children here, I find this pretty horrifying. In the next video, Yuan tells the story of Adam and Eve. He explains the implications of the fall of man and eventually says this. Another consequence of the fall is our sin nature. Each of us is born with the nature corrupted by sin. Romans 3 verse 10 says, none is righteous, no, not one. Sin affects every part of us, our actions, thoughts, and desires, including our sexual desires. A sin nature is like a broken wheel on a shopping cart. You try to push the cart straight, but the broken wheel keeps pushing it in the wrong direction. Thus, sin nature in every human being has changed our overall trajectory from obedience to rebellion. It's important to note that this sin nature is not some substance inside of us. Rather, it's a corruption of our human nature. This means that our sinful nature is not our essence, but a pollution. This, of course, is just more narrative building. Can we demonstrate the existence of a sin nature? Can we observe or measure it somehow? Can we actually demonstrate that Adam and Eve existed or that their actions had any impact on humanity in the first place? Of course not. But the kids watching aren't given the space to ask such questions. Since the 1970s, when the fields of psychology and medicine finally rejected the idea that homosexuality was a mental disorder, the ex-gay industry has often argued that it is. Queerness is a defect, it's something broken that needs to be fixed, they taught. Yuan does not repeat this rhetoric exactly. He clearly does, however, treat queerness as a disorder. It's not a medical disorder, it's a spiritual disorder. Whether you call it a disease like the failed ex-gay industry did, or a pollution of our nature like Yuan does, the message is basically the same. It implies that queerness is inherently wrong, disordered, dirty, harmful, and in need of fixing. It does not demonstrate these implications, but rather, again, delivers unsubstantiated claims wrapped in the pretty package of narrative. You see, God's love is not reserved for the sinless or for the one who obeys him perfectly. No, God loves us even though we're sinners and deserve condemnation. This is what grace is. I sign off my emails and letters with the tagline, undeserving of his grace. He loves us even though we don't deserve it. I know this is supposed to be comforting, but in effect, this is an idea sure to destroy a believer's sense of self-worth and condition them to tolerate mistreatment. The answers from church leaders made the pain even deeper. The message always seemed to be, you're not enough. Both when I was a fundamentalist and when I worked at a battered women's shelter in the past, just after college, I saw this idea expressed over and over. At college, it was about God. At the shelter, it was about violent and abusive partners. This belief is a piece of a vicious cycle, which I call the abuse cycle of sexual sin. I'll discuss that in detail at the end of the next lesson, so keep this bit of shame-producing rhetoric in mind until then. Now on to lesson four, where I think things start to get a lot weirder. Here, Yuan talks about desires and their relation to sin. When we desire something, there is always an action associated with it. If the end of a desire is in line with God's moral standard, then that desire is good. If the object and action of a desire breaks God's moral standard, then that desire is sinful. In Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28, Jesus teaches, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The Greek word translated into lust literally means desire. In other words, everyone who looks at a woman with desire for her has already committed adultery. The context communicates that the desired action is adultery. Even though the desired act of adultery was never committed, the desire is equivalent to having committed the sinful act. 
Having grown up with this teaching, I now think this seriously oversimplifies what experiencing sexual desire or attraction is like. It makes it sound like you either see someone attractive and don't feel anything, or full-on fantasize about how exactly you would be sexually involved with this person. The truth is that experiencing your sexuality isn't like either of those most of the time. When I was a Christian teen, I'd practice obsessive mental discipline to keep myself from thinking what I was told were adulterous thoughts. Eventually, I'd see someone attractive and have a wordless, pictureless feeling of pleasure. I'd think, ugh, I did it again. I objectified that woman and committed adultery with her in my heart. It didn't matter that the feeling was automatic. I wasn't married to her, and the feeling was more than simply acknowledging in some aloof way that she was attractive, so it was sin. I realize now that no amount of mental discipline could have stopped these feelings because they are simply automatic, just as feeling hungry or craving a specific food is automatic, especially when you've prevented yourself from eating for a while. Trying to prevent these thoughts is entirely doomed to fail. Also, even actual adulterous or lustful thoughts do not create the same observable outcomes as actual adulterous actions. I doubt even Yuan would deny this. Treating them as equivalent actions can lead to serious injustice. From experience in fundamentalist and evangelical communities, I can tell you that the number of morally diligent young people who experience extreme self-esteem and self-hatred issues as a result of this teaching is staggering. Thinking that you are equivalent to a serial cheater or even a rapist because you experience sexual thoughts sometimes is torturous. More on that in a bit. So this is already a really long video and I could use a break, so I'm going to call in some help from a friend for the next couple of clips. Let me know if you recognize him. Sexual desire isn't bad in itself and is right in the context of biblical marriage. Desire's goodness all depends on whether its end aligns with God's moral standard. All right, Dr. Yuan, let's see it. For example, in the wedding celebrated in the Song of Solomon, the bride exalts, I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. This mutual delight is both blessed and celebrated by God. However, the bride's desires before marriage still need to be restrained, as the bride herself affirms, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Here I would point out that most scholars would suggest that the Song of Solomon is actually talking about uh, premarital sex. Uh, there's a lot going on here. The, the woman is a part of her father's household. Her brothers are, are uh, kind of oppressing her. They're going out into the city looking for her to, to bring her back, but she's engaging in these uh, affairs with, with her beloved while still a part of her father's household, which indicates that she is not yet married. Uh, and so the notion that this is uh, demonstrating the appropriate uh, restraint and then uh, unloosing of sexual desire is already uh, misrepresenting what or what the text most likely uh, are representing. Uh, and there's a wonderful uh, book about this. Uh, Jennifer Knuth wrote a book uh, called Unprotected Texts, which is a phenomenal book and uh, has a chapter on the Song of Solomon and how explicit uh, it is about the goodness of sexual desire uh, and even seems to represent it as taking place outside of marriage. If you somehow don't know Dr. Dan McClellan yet, he is a scholar of the Bible and religion. While Dr. Christopher Yuan got his education from institutions which require the student to agree with the school's theology before being educated, Dr. Dan McClellan did not. He's actually a lot more representative of the field of biblical studies and studies of religion in general. It's pretty interesting how that causes a difference in their perspectives. First, let's consider same-sex sexual desires. The Bible communicates that the actions of same-sex sexual desires are sinful. In Leviticus 18 verse 22, God commands his people, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 includes the act of same-sex sex in a list of other sins. We will discuss these passages later in lesson 9. 
But God's word communicates that same-sex sexual behaviors miss the mark. Thus, same-sex sexual desires miss the mark as well. This is an inference that I don't think is merited by the text because it assumes that these restrictions that are taking place in Leviticus and in 1 Corinthians 6 are based on an adequate understanding of human sexuality and the origins of sexual desire. And if we go to Romans 1, where Paul is talking about Romans 1, Paul is setting up the Gentiles as sinful, therefore worthy of death, but then in Romans 2 is going to turn the table on the Jewish folks who are, uh, are um, you know, cackling about how we're so much better than them, and, Ro and Paul says, no, you all are condemned under the law as well. But what the way that Paul represents what I think is, is probably a reference to same-sex intercourse in verses 26 and 27 in Romans 1 is the product of God basically removing whatever uh, natural limits were placed on sexual desire as punishment for their worshiping the created over the creator. There's this natural theology argument that Paul makes that uh, they can observe nature, they can arrive at an adequate understanding of God's nature and how God expects to be worship. Uh, and since they don't do that, they are without excuse, and God's going to do all this stuff. And the result, the outcome of this, will be uh, women uh, giving up their natural usefulness to engage in that which is unnatural, and men doing the same, uh, lusting one for another. And this is a entirely inaccurate understanding of human sexuality. Um, Same-sex desire, a homosexual desire, is the other side of the same coin, of heterosexual desire. They come from the same place. Now, there are a lot of ways that people can muddy the waters regarding uh, the origins of sexual desire, and is it is it uh, nature or nurture? The overwhelming consensus is that whatever the, the fluidity of sexual desire, which is on a spectrum that, you know, can have a lot of overlap and integration in the center, it's not something that people can change at will. It is immutable in that sense. Paul's sexual ethic is based on a 2,000-year-old outdated, irrelevant, and false notion of human sexuality. So I, I think this is basing way too much. It's relying way too much on the authority of Scripture and ignoring just what we know about the world around us today. Okay, Dr. Dan McClellan will be back in Lessons 5 and 9, but I'll take over again for now. Let's consider same-sex romantic desires. Some Christians claim that these romantic desires are good, so long as there is no sexual act involved. But let's think about this. What are the actions associated with same-sex romantic desires? This may be difficult to discern as we often equate romance with sexual acts. The two may be associated, but are not always the same. Basically, romance is when you want this person completely and exclusively to yourself. This is a strangely toxic and immature view of romance, right? Romance can involve possessive feelings, but it doesn't always. It can certainly exist in healthier ways, like developing a deep emotional connection with another person, which includes coming to value their well-being even beyond your own self-interest or possession. It almost feels like Yuan is purposely representing queer love as exclusively immature and selfish. But I guess that's not the worst thing he could say. I mean, it would be a lot worse if he, you know, compared it to incest. To put it bluntly, if you had romantic desires for your sister, your brother, or your mom, would it be right or wrong? We all know the answer to that. Although same-sex romantic desires may seem innocent, they're really not. These desires are essentially yearning to become one with and be permanently and exclusively united emotionally to someone we romantically desire. <sighs> Okay. <laughs> Comparing feeling romantically attracted to someone of the same sex or gender to incest is such a fundamentalist move. I, I remember it being compared to incest and bestiality constantly growing up, which always incited a sense of disgust. As I got older, I realized this wasn't actually an argument. <laughs> 
Sure, the comparison sparks disgust, but that's all it does. It doesn't make a valid point about how or why they're the same, or how or why being gay is harmful. Incest and bestiality taboos exist largely because those actions cause tangible harm, like disease and the destruction of families. Gay romance, or even sex, does not cause harm any more tangibly than straight romance or sex, though. This comparison is a lazy attempt at making a perfectly benign thing seem scary and disgusting. What hope is there since we all face temptations? In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, Paul provides an encouraging and empowering promise. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Paul is reminding us that our temptations aren't exceptional, unique, or even unbearable. God provides assurance that each temptation will be in proportion to the capability of the tempted. Furthermore, we have the promise of a way of escape. Please catch what Paul is saying here. Superhuman capacity or even great faith is not required to endure temptation. Even the weakest of believers has a way out. This should be of great comfort to us. Every temptation always falls within the ability of the one tempted to persevere. This is another major piece of the abuse cycle of sexual sin. If you deviate from God's standard by a single inch, you are solely to blame. God said he will never test us beyond our ability, so circumstances can never be a relevant contributing factor. Even more importantly, these standards that Christian authorities like Yuan have told you are gods can never, ever be considered unreasonable. If you break the rules, even when trying your absolute best to keep them, it doesn't matter that you tried. It doesn't matter that you broke them accidentally with an automatic, barely conscious thought. It doesn't matter that you've done exactly what we've told you to do to stop your desires and that didn't work. It's your fault. Period. Okay, one more clip and we'll put all the pieces of the cycle together and discuss. The true test is not in our ability to endure temptation, but in our reliance in the faithfulness of our God. Here's the final piece. After you've failed to meet the demands of those like Yuan who say they are delivering God's word, they offer a supposed solution. Trust in the faithfulness of God. Believe he can empower you to meet his standards. Just believe that. So, with all the pieces put together, the cycle goes like this. You believe that an automatic physiological response that basically everyone experiences is the same as actual adultery and is considered sin. The solution to this is to trust God and believe he will deliver you from this, so you try to implement this solution. If and when this doesn't work, you think it is 100% your fault. You don't consider the circumstances, you don't question whether the standard you're trying to meet is reasonable, and you don't ask whether the method you were given to stop your desires actually works. You feel you are unworthy of God's grace because you did this, but believe he's so good that he'll love you even when you don't deserve it. Because you have no confidence in your ability to do anything of your own will at this point, you resolve to try to trust and rely on God even more next time. This is a vicious cycle that is set up so that you can't question the people that set it up. It is designed to control your thoughts and behavior so that you do not trust your own agency and instead submit to someone in authority. When I worked in a battered women's shelter, I saw that this was very similar to what the abused women there experienced with their partners. There was nothing they could do to appease their partner, and they would always be blamed or punished regardless of what they did or did not do. Almost all of them internalized their partner's claim that they weren't worthy of love and that if they left, no one would love them. That kept them in the relationship even when it harmed them. From the outside, it was easy to see that their partner created this horrible situation to keep someone subservient to them and that the woman had never behaved wrongly and was obviously worthy of love just as she was. Actually, several of the abused women themselves understood that this was a vicious cycle, but the cycle created so much dependence on their abuser 
that they still struggled to break it. Now, I don't think Yuan created a system like this in order to abuse people on purpose. The abuse cycle of sexual sin existed before he was even born. I just think implementing cycles like these are a highly effective way to manipulate and control people. So certain Christian institutions and abusive boyfriends happen to converge on their use. Having sexual thoughts and needs and acting to meet those needs, whether you are queer or not, is not inherently wrong or harmful. There are perfectly healthy ways to be a queer or straight sexual being, and this is readily observable. But if you are indoctrinated into a belief system that creates this cycle of self-doubt and dependence, your ability to see this is taken from you. This is the outcome this curriculum seeks for its students. On to lesson five. Christians often assume that the Bible promotes heterosexuality. They'll even point to Genesis and say, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and. But let's carefully look at scripture. Does the Bible truly bless heterosexuality in all its forms? Certainly, God blesses biblical marriage, that is one man and one woman, which we'll go over in lesson seven. But heterosexuality is not equivalent to biblical marriage. The Bible does not affirm all the other forms of heterosexuality. As a matter of fact, every expression outside of biblical marriage, whether in an opposite sex relationship or all same sex relationships, is condemned by God as missing the mark that is as sinful. This is an increasingly common sentiment I hear from conservative Christians. Our ideas aren't like those many, many, many failed gay conversion therapy efforts. We don't unevenly condemn sexual immorality because we place restrictions on heterosexual behavior too. We don't think God demands anything different from same-sex attracted people than he does from opposite sex attracted people. If I'm expected to be sexually moral as someone with opposite sex attractions, it's fair to expect the same from people with same sex attractions. There's still a massive difference between the demands on gay and straight people, though. Straight people are given a way to have their sexual needs met, and actual scientific research shows that getting married is usually pretty healthy and beneficial for people. Gay people, on the other hand, are not allowed to even think a single gay thought for their entire lives, and research shows that this way of life is usually not healthy and predicts bad outcomes for queer people. These are not the same. This is not fair. You're not more reasonable for having this standard. I think a couple of Yuan's statements to follow reinforce this. Heterosexuality is not fully wrong. It's just not fully right. Well-known British preacher from the late 1800s, Charles Spurgeon said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong, it's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Heterosexuality is almost right. Heterosexuality is the right direction, not the right goal. See, homosexuality and heterosexuality are still treated very differently, with heterosexuality even being called the right direction. This idea is especially reminiscent of gay conversion ministries as it implies heterosexuality is a direction that gay people can go in. The next video in this lesson contains what I think is the central message of this entire curriculum, and in it, you'll see Yuan do more than imply this. We'll get to that right after Dr. McClellan responds to how Yuan sees the whole sexual ethic of the Bible. Now that we've established that heterosexuality may be the right direction, but not the right goal, we're back to the question, what is biblical sexuality? Instead of using a secular framework that divides up humanity according to sexual desires, heterosexuality, bisexuality, homosexuality, let's use a biblical one. Not heterosexuality, not homosexuality, but holy sexuality. What exactly is holy sexuality? When reading through the Bible, there's only two paths that God lays out for us when it comes to sexuality. When you are single, be chaste, be sexually pure. If you marry, be faithful to your spouse of the opposite sex. In other words, 
Holy sexuality is chastity in singleness or faithfulness in marriage. Okay, that may be the way this individual is defining holy sexuality. That is not biblical sexuality by any stretch of the imagination whatsoever. When we look in the Hebrew Bible, polygamy was normative. Now, it was generally uh, confined to the elite, those who could afford to sustain multiple uh, different wives. But adultery prohibited a woman from sleeping with another man if she was married, whether that man was married or not. It absolutely did not prohibit a man from sleeping with another woman unless that other woman was already married because that was a violation of her husband's property rights. But if a man was married and went out with ha and had sex with another woman, no problems whatsoever, according to the Hebrew Bible. In fact, according to some, some ancient Jewish law, the act of having sex with an unmarried woman was reified their marriage. That was, that was basically the act of proposing, only it was kind of one that the woman didn't have any say in. Um, and so adultery in the Hebrew Bible did not apply to a man who was married who was having sex with an unmarried woman. Um, it may result in him taking on another wife, uh, but that was not prohibited in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. Uh, so this is an attempt to just try to conjure up an idea, what, can we, what would we like marriage to be about today, and then just saying the Bible authorizes this. And the Bible does absolutely no such thing whatsoever. And even in the New Testament, uh, there's, there's no clear or explicit rejection of polygamy in the New Testament. We know that at Qumran, they seem to not like polygamy. We know there were some other early Christian groups that uh, opposed polygamy. Nothing in the New Testament uh, explicitly engages the question of polygamy. And uh, the notion that, uh, you know, an overseer should be the husband of one wife, that in and of itself, even if it is about polygamy, which it might not be, it might be about not remarrying after either divorce or the loss of a wife. But even if it is about polygamy, all it's saying is if you want to be a, an overseer, you need to be the husband of one wife. It's not saying there's something flatly, immorally, innately wrong with uh, being the husband of more than one wife. So this is flatly misrepresenting what is, sexuality is in the Bible, what uh, marriage is in the Bible, and it differs from earlier in the Bible to, to later in the Bible. So, not impressed so far. In a world that blurs the lines of morality into every shade of gray, we must realize that biblical sexuality is not vague. It's black and white. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the previous discussion might might clarify that there is some there is some vagueness there are some shades of gray and and additionally there is conflict you have uh, earlier texts where marriage is represented one way you have later texts where where marriage is represented another way you have questions of leveret marriage uh you have it, even in the Hebrew Bible, if you look at Leviticus and you, set, and you accept that it is prohibiting male same-sex intercourse, there's not a single breath of uh, the Hebrew Bible that even addresses the question of female same-sex intercourse, which is why in, in most streams of Jewish tradition, uh, there's no prohibition on lesbianism. In fact, there is, there is one law that says a priest, a Kohen, is allowed to marry a woman who's been with another woman flatly prohibited from marrying a woman who's been with another man, but if she's been with another woman, there are no problems here because the text doesn't ever, doesn't ever address that. Uh, and when we get into the New Testament, the sexual, sexuality is in Matthew and in Paul is derided. The kingdom of heaven is going to be asexual. You know, there will be no marrying, no giving in marriage. Everybody will be as the angels of heaven. This is kind of a reflection of the Enochic notion of the angels committing this horrific sin by having sex with human women. And so angels are supposed to be asexual. That's how the eternities are going to be for the faithful. Paul is saying, you know, we should, um, uh, I wish that everybody were, were like me. You have Matthew 19, where Jesus says some people are born eunuchs, some people are made eunuchs by men, some people make themselves eunuch for the, sakes, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, which would seem to uh, 
indicate that uh, asexuality would be the higher law, the priority. And he says this is, uh, let he who can receive this receive it. So no, it's absolutely not black and white. Thanks for that, Dr. McClellan. I can take it from here. I'll see you again in lesson nine. As we think through the concept of holy sexuality, chastity and singleness, or faithfulness in marriage, you may be thinking, well, there's only one path for those who experience same-sex attractions, which is singleness, right? No, not necessarily so. Let me tell you about a friend. After years in the gay community, Mark became a Christian and no longer pursued same-sex relationships. He never had desires for women, even as a new believer. With a close network of friends from his new family, the church, he was content to be single for the rest of his life, assuming it was his only path. Mark had a close friend, Andrea, who was also a new follower of Christ. She came out of a broken past that consisted of abusive boyfriends and a couple abortions. So she decided to hold off on dating to mainly focus on a relationship with God. The two felt really safe together. There wasn't that weirdness that often happens between a guy and a girl. Does he like me? Does she like me? Because Mark knew she didn't want to date and Andrea knew he didn't like girls. But after some time, Mark began noticing some things about her, her hair. She smelled good and she had curves. He says, puberty is hard going through once, try going through puberty twice. He built up enough courage and asked Andrea out on a date. After some dating, he asked her to marry him. And on their wedding night, he told his new bride, honey, I can't explain this. I'm not attracted to any other women. I'm only attracted to you. Holiness is not dependent on our sexual desires or any desires for that matter. Holiness is given by the only one who is holy. This is clearly a conversion narrative. Mark did the right thing, trusted God enough, and God made him straight for one woman. You see, Yuan tries to stand apart from the many failed gay conversion therapies and ministries, but his way of doing this is just rejecting pseudoscience and replacing it with faith healing. Other ministries may insist that they have a method to change sexuality for anyone, while Yuan says it's only God who can change sexuality for those he chooses, but the claim is still that sexuality can be purposely changed for some people through a specific intervention. However you frame it, data does not support this. We simply do not have rigorously collected evidence that sexuality can be purposely changed, and that's not for lack of trying. Any narrative otherwise purposely ignores the best quality evidence we have for how sexuality works and instead embraces rare and biased anecdotes to fit one's desired conclusion. This is pseudo-intellectual, lazy theology, and incredibly dangerous misinformation. Now on to lesson six, which is all about singleness and how it can be a gift. I'm only going to respond to one clip here, which is found in video two. Even though Paul was single and had no physical offspring, he was a spiritual father to many spiritual sons and daughters. He not only carried out the Great Commission, but he also obeyed the creation mandate, be fruitful and multiply. In ancient Israel, there was a focus on having physical children. Many offspring was a blessing, but with the coming of Christ, the blessing is having spiritual children. People under the old covenant grew by procreation, but now people under the new covenant grow by regeneration. Even if you're single, if you know Jesus, you can have children, spiritual children. Being single provides undivided devotion to make disciples and have spiritual children. So what good can come out of this gift of being single? It provides undivided devotion to the Lord to make disciples, that is, spiritual children, thus heeding the Great Commission and the creation mandate. If you've been watching my channel in the last few months, you've probably heard me talk about credibility-enhancing displays, or CREDS for short. 
The idea is that when people act as if their supernatural belief is true and that act costs the believer something, that signals to others that there is something to their supernatural belief. In other words, their costly display enhances the perceived credibility of the belief. This theory has been studied, and anthropologists have found that one's exposure to creds predicts belief in God, while lack of exposure to creds predicts lack of belief in God. This is relevant here, in that attempting to suppress one's sexuality entirely is a very costly display. A person who does this effectively signals to others that the religion which drives that suppression is true. Yuan is right that gay people who embrace chastity can bring people into their faith, and probably even have an inherent advantage in doing so. This is one reason why I think anti-gay theology is so common and regularly experiences spikes in popularity every few years or decades. It plays on the fundamental psychology of religious belief inherent to all humans. However, this feature of a religion is a double-edged sword for that religion. The guy responsible for the theory of creds, Joseph Henrik, hypothesizes that since a person's moral hypocrisy undermines their creds, hypocrisy of believers is often responsible for doubt and apostasy. And this is, of course, one reason why a hypocrisy can be very undermining. So if someone was supposedly celibate or supposedly fasting and you see them sneaking crackers or something, uh, th then your, your, your faith in them as a, as a source of valuable transmitted information goes down. So while ex-gays are probably quite effective in bringing people into the faith when they stay on the uh, straight and narrow, they're also especially effective at destroying the perceived credibility of the faith when they inevitably realize the suppression isn't working and come out. Or get caught slipping up. Or in. Requiring LGBT people to suppress their sexuality, then, is a high-risk, high-reward strategy for any religious group. I'm interested to see how long it'll be before the kids raised with Yuan's teachings start to come out publicly and, consequently, damage his ministry's image. Time for Lesson 7, which focuses on marriage. For some, marriage has become more important than even God. On June 26, 2015, the United States Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage in all 50 states. It was during this time that I realized how much our country idolized marriage. Gay activists asserted that not being allowed to marry was denying them value and dignity. But marriage is not meant to give anyone value and dignity. We're all born with inherent value and dignity because we are created in God's image. This is a pretty massive misrepresentation of the fight for marriage equality in the U.S. and those who fought for it. When someone says that denying a group of people a right denies them value and dignity, this is not a statement that practicing that right is what gives a person value and dignity. Gay people and their allies don't think getting married is what grants a person these things. Instead, proponents of marriage equality argue that all people have value and a right to a dignified place in society, and denying a specific group of people a right, which most other people enjoy, purposely treats some people as if they are inherently less valuable and deserving of dignity than others. Yuan might say he considers all people equally valuable because of his theology, but in practice, he advocates that certain people be treated as less deserving of a common and largely beneficial social institution. He can describe his beliefs as positively as he wants, but that doesn't change the fact that when he argues against legal marriage equality, and he does, he's advocating legal discrimination. The last paragraph of the majority opinion, written by retired Supreme Court Justice Kennedy, stated, No union is more profound than marriage, for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. I respectfully disagree. Marriage may be an expression of love. It is not the highest ideal of love. God is. Viewing marriage as embodying the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family can put marriage in the place of God. And that is idolatry. I find it kind of 
odd that Yuan urges Christians not to idolize marriage, especially legal marriage, or view it as the highest ideal of a relationship, but then still advocates for gay people to be legally denied this specific relationship, but not others. He's at once treating marriage as the only kind of relationship so sacred that only specific people should be legally allowed it, and saying that viewing legal marriage as such a high ideal is wrong. Yuan, wouldn't you be a lot more consistent in your view if you said that anyone can be legally married by the state if they want, but you just personally don't believe those marriages are theologically legitimate? This would keep you from idolizing legal marriage or treating the state as an arbiter of God's love. Doesn't that make a lot more sense even from your perspective? Marriage is a covenant. This correct understanding of marriage stands in contrast to the secular view of marriage as a right. Our culture wrongly thinks that marriage is a basic human right that everyone has access and freedom to choose. However, marriage is not a right, but a holy covenant between one man and one woman, husband and wife. If marriage was truly a right, then why can't all those singles who want to marry get it? Where is their right? Uh, I'm sorry. What? This badly misunderstands the secular concept of human rights in the first place. Human rights are a practical concept created to classify freedoms and privileges that, if allowed and protected specifically by the state, would maximize human flourishing for all people. They are not a list of goods and services that the transcendent order of the universe demands be delivered to all people at birth. Under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, Americans have the right to due process and equal protections. Basically, the state prohibits deprivation of life, liberty, and property, and can't deny anyone equal protection under the law. This means, according to the ruling of the Supreme Court in the case of Obergefell v. Hodges, U.S. states cannot prohibit same-sex couples from marrying on the same terms and conditions as opposite-sex couples. Basically, this just means that two people have the same legal opportunity to be married regardless of their sex. Given this understanding of the law, it makes no sense to point to the singleness of people who want to get married one day as an inconsistency in the application of human rights. Forcing people to get married would be an actual inconsistency in the application of human rights, as it would violate at least one person's rights to life, liberty, property, and equal protection under the law. Yuan's insinuation otherwise is <laughs> totally absurd. Remember that this curriculum is targeted at children and teenagers, who almost definitely don't understand the philosophical or legal concepts Yuan is criticizing here. He can easily get away with ridiculous gotcha points like this because he knows his audience can't apply proper scrutiny to them. I wish I could tell you that this was an uncommon tactic in fundamentalist indoctrination, but it's unfortunately one of the very cornerstones of their approach to educating children. The next clip I'm going to respond to is pretty heavy and only somewhat related to marriage, but I want to include it to make a vital point about opposing discrimination from people like Yuan. A few of you may know this, but my dear father, very suddenly and unexpectedly in July 2022, went home to be with the Lord, leaving my mother a widow. He was my biggest cheerleader and has funded this incredibly important project. He wanted more than anything else for this video series to be finished. Actually, the week before his home going, it was his birthday. And his birthday wish was for these lessons to be finished as soon as possible so we can empower youth to understand, embrace, and celebrate biblical sexuality. My dad and mom were married for close to 58 years. Now, their marriage has been fulfilled. Marriage is so good. But what is better than marriage is union with Christ in eternity. When mom and I were at dad's bedside and his brain function was gone and his heart rate was falling, mom looked at me very adamantly and told me, we are going to tell everyone that Dr. Leon Yuan is not dead. He is now more alive than he ever was before. My dad would want every one of you watching right now 
to have eternal life with Jesus. Nothing, nothing is more important than that. When ultra-religious folks bring up stories and experiences like this, it becomes more difficult to respond to their ideas in a critical way, even if it's warranted. These people structure all the meaning and hope in their lives around this belief system. That's not necessarily entirely bad for them. It might be beneficial in a lot of ways, and I think their right to practice their religion in their personal lives should be protected. That said, they use this belief system to demand that all people believe and act exactly as they do, attempting to destroy the way in which others structure meaning in their lives. Such religious people even seek to legally remove the rights of others. This puts someone like me in a difficult position. I want people to be free to practice their religion, and I don't want to get in the way of the beneficial aspects of faith. But I also realize that some people wield their faith as such a dangerous weapon that someone must block or destroy that weapon in order to help the largest number of people. So I'm out here as someone who believes in religious pluralism actively undermining the faith of certain people. I know the pain of losing one's fundamentalist faith, and while I don't want to inflict that pain on others, it's far preferable to do so than to allow fundamentalists to inflict far greater pain on everyone with whom they disagree. Moving on to lesson eight, which gets even more explicit about sexual sin. Our bodies are meant to be members of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 15, Paul continues and reminds Christians, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. The apostle is explaining that being a member of Christ is not a metaphor, it's a physical reality. So if a Christian commits sexual immorality with his physical body, he is in essence uniting with another sinner when he should be exclusively united with Christ. Let that sink in. As a Christian, if you have sex with your boyfriend, experiment with someone of the same sex, watch pornography, or even masturbate, you're actually involving a member of Christ in that nefarious act. This amounts to nothing more than a narrative framework intended to inflict shame upon people for doing perfectly normal things that are not inherently harmful. You can't demonstrate that you are a member of Christ in any literal or tangible way. You can't demonstrate that Christ or any other invisible being is watching at any point. But if you put this narrative in the minds of children, it can make them feel like an authority is watching their every move, even in private, and that any sexual act is literally a polluting and non-consensual act worthy of punishment. This, without offering any argument or evidence for a sexual act's harmful effect, convinces many that their benign behavior is perverse and disgusting, tantamount to forcing God himself to have sex against his will. Sexual restraint is generally a good thing and something everyone needs to learn, but teaching it in this way is lazy, dishonest, and potentially quite harmful. We are meant to be one spirit with the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 16 and 17, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Paul mentions body, flesh, and spirit in these two verses to show that sexual immorality has both physical and spiritual implications. What we do sexually with our bodies affects us in a myriad of ways. We learned in lessons four and seven that one flesh means a holistic reality going beyond the physical. Even though becoming one body in sexual immorality is not the same as becoming one flesh in marriage, the implication is that there is a spiritual component of sexual immorality. As a matter of fact, there is always a spiritual component to sin. This makes sexual immorality all the more grave for the Christian. Again, there's no substance to this claim. You don't actually know there's any spiritual component to a physical act until you can observe and measure the spiritual component involved. 
which no one has done. This, again, just uses narrative to convince kids that doing anything but exactly what Yuan tells them is a grave mistake with terrible consequences. Even if Yuan really believes this himself, and I think he does, it's still little more than a ridiculous scare tactic. I want to take a moment now to talk to those of you who may have already fallen into sexual sin. You may just now be realizing that sexual immorality is a serious sin that shouldn't be trivialized. You may be overwhelmed with guilt and shame. Let me share something from the heart. You know my story and the depths of depravity that I experienced. I too was overwhelmed with guilt until I read this in 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This verse begins with a condition, if we confess. What does confess mean? It means being honest with God, being specific about how we have sinned. Of course, God already knows since he knows everything. But naming our sin means we recognize it and aren't trivializing it or trying to justify it. This also means we should confess and be honest with at least a few select mature Christians. If you're a young man, confess and be honest with an older man like your dad, youth leader, pastor, or mentor. If you're a young woman, confess and be honest with an older woman like your mom, youth leader, pastor's wife, or mentor. Secrecy is Satan's best weapon. The prince of lies works best in darkness. Confession brings our sin into the light. When the consequences of sexual sin are painted as so severe and the bar for sexual purity is so high as to be impossible, saying that God offers forgiveness is still rather cold comfort. Sure, you'll be forgiven, but you're going to need to ask for forgiveness again and again and again, probably for the rest of your life, no matter how hard you try to do better. This effectively puts you in the position of perpetually groveling before an authority that says, There's never any excuse for any slip-up. You are unworthy. The fact that they say, I forgive you and love you anyway, doesn't really boost the self-esteem of many trapped in this situation. Now, the confession to a mentor element just adds to this. In my evangelical Christian university, this was pretty common, especially for guys who struggled with same-sex attraction. They reveal their struggle to someone in authority over them, that authority would form an agreement with the guy, and then the guy would be made to admit to every time he thought about men or masturbated for the rest of his academic career. I knew a guy from my school whose boss had him come into his office and describe what he masturbated to multiple times a week for a few years. This was supposed to help the young man overcome his same-sex attraction, but it didn't, and he later left the school and came out publicly. In fact, if you went to college with me, you probably know who I'm talking about. This is not my story, so I don't want to speak for him, but I think that situations like that are clearly abusive. Whether the authority gets some sexual kick out of it or not, whether they try to take physical advantage of the young person's vulnerability or not, such situations create power imbalances that place the young person at great risk. Confessing every sexual thought or act to an authority gives them power over you, to control or manipulate you, and that's exactly what this practice was invented for. Yuan's ideas are tools of control. Again, I think he's sincere in his belief, but that doesn't change the fact that they are a technology meant to create conformity for the sake of the power of an authority figure, whether a church, a religious leader, or anyone else. Do not form these confessional relationships. In the next video, Yuan wants to reassure us that sex isn't all bad. You may be wondering, if sexual sin is such a big deal, why did God even create sex in the first place? Wouldn't life be much easier without so many struggles and temptations. Why did God create sex in the first place? What is the purpose of sex? To answer these questions, let's turn to the Word of God. Scripture consistently celebrates the goodness, beauty, and wholesomeness of sex in biblical marriage. Here are five things the Bible communicates about sex in marriage. First, 
Sex in biblical marriage is good. Sex is God's idea. He created it and blessed it. God created sex as a special and exclusive gift, something to be enjoyed between husband and wife. And since sex in marriage is good, when a husband and a wife mutually come together, they are free from shame in the marriage bed. Sex in marriage is the context in which two people can be naked and don't have to feel ashamed. This means that husband and wife must be covered to everyone else except each other. Sex in biblical marriage puts shame on hold because in its only proper context, it can be enjoyed guilt-free because sex in biblical marriage is good. If only this were true. Imagine you've basically never deliberated your sexuality in any depth, believing it's wrong to do so. You've been taught to view masturbation as a filthy, nefarious act. Throughout your life, you have even tried your hardest to stop any sexual thought. When you failed, you felt immense shame for violating the body of God himself. Now it's your wedding day, and you're suddenly allowed to express your sexuality with another person. Can you just flip a switch, override your years or even decades of programming, and feel sexually unashamed and confident? Probably not. Being unable to do so, in fact, is a common problem in very conservative Christian marriages. So one semester during my junior year of college, I believe, some student body activity council or something like that turned this big wall on campus, usually used for flyers, into a confession wall. It was meant to be a fun, non-serious thing where students could write funny confessions on a post-it note and stick it on the wall. On the day the confession wall started, I put a confession up there, which I'm pretty sure was a quote from Spongebob. The inner machinations of my mind are an enigma. I went back the next day to check out the wall, and it turned out that people from married housing on campus had found the wall, and things had gotten pretty rough. There were a lot of confessions up there expressing serious personal and marital problems, all related to sex. I hate having sex with my spouse. I still feel so ashamed of my body and sexuality. How in the world do they expect us to bury our sexuality and then just flip a switch one day and not feel guilty about having sex? It doesn't work. I feel so much shame and pressure during sex that I can't perform and it's hurting my relationship. I always thought that since God blesses sex and marriage, I would want to have sex with my husband once we got married. It's been a year, and I think I just have to accept the fact that I'm not attracted to men in the first place. I wish I realized that before marrying him. This was pretty disturbing to read, as you might imagine, and when I went back to read more on the third day, every confession had been removed and the usual flyers were back up. By senior year, when many people my age were getting engaged and married, I didn't have to hear these stories from a confession wall. Friends and friends of friends circulated them by word of mouth around campus, lamenting their situation and crying out for help. This doesn't happen to everyone, fortunately, but it occurs often enough to cast serious doubt on Yuan's claim that the Christian marriage bed is free of shame. Sex, marriage, and relationships in general are not magic. You get from them what you practice and cultivate. If you practice an obsessive compulsive regimen of demonizing every sexual thought before marriage, you will probably continue to see the psychological effects of that practice even after marriage. Time for Lesson 9, which deals with biblical interpretation and attempts to debunk arguments for LGBT-affirming views of scripture. Time for Dr. Dan McClellan to really shine. The route to answering the question about whether the Bible condemns homosexuality is something called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the way we interpret the Bible, and there is a stark contrast between the hermeneutics of those who hold to the biblical view of sexuality and those who reject it. The key to correct Bible interpretation, or hermeneutics, is context. I'm sure you've heard it many times before that we must read the Bible in context. This is 100% true. What many don't realize are the different types of context. What are the different types of contexts? Literary context, historical context, and canonical context. Literary context 
focuses on the verses and paragraphs around the text being studied. Historical context focuses on the history and culture around the time that the text was written. Canonical context focuses on how the text fits in the whole canon of Scripture, that is, all 66 books of the Bible. In other words, Scripture interprets Scripture. Ooh, that's that's a big no-no in my book. Scripture interprets interprets scripture, and that's an outcome of canonical context. And the problem with canonical context is not a single person who wrote any single syllable of text that is in the Bible ever lived to see the collection of text that we know as the Bible. Our canon is a post-biblical innovation. And so none of them operated with a canonical context as we understand it, meaning that is an, the imposition of a post-biblical creation onto the Bible. And that is a, what, one of the things that that does is it functions as a unifying framework because uh, canon is always uh, associated with a bunch of ideologies, a bunch of dogmas. The three main ones, uh, in my opinion, are inspiration, inerrancy, and univocality. And so the scripture interprets scripture presupposes all three of those because it presupposes that all scripture comes from one source, one source that is divine and therefore inerrant, and therefore all scripture speaks with one unified voice, meaning doesn't matter where you're looking, every last passage that you could possibly extract from the Bible agrees with every other passage you could possibly extract from the Bible. And that is all, there are no data whatsoever that support any of these dogmas. These are dogmas that people choose to accept because that's all you can do. Because if you look at them critically, they just fall to pieces. Uh, and so already the canonical context is fallacious and it is drawing in post-biblical ideologies so that it can keep tight control on the literary and the historical context and ensure that that does not allow the question to get away from them. At this point in Lesson 9, Yuan uses his method of biblical interpretation to try to debunk arguments that the Bible affirms LGBT people and doesn't condemn same-sex sex. An issue that Dr. McClellan and I found with this section was that the arguments Yuan chose to represent his opposition were pretty bad, and his response was extremely long-winded. We spent like an hour dealing with it all, so it's just, it's way too complex and lengthy to include here. If you want to see our whole call where we dive into this, it'll be linked in the description as soon as I can edit it together after I finish editing this monstrosity of a video. <laughs> Give me a couple days if you're watching this video on the day of its release. For now, here's a highlight of that conversation that I think makes an important point. Even if his point is correct that these specific authors in these specific contexts were condemning certain types of same-sex sex or even all types of, of same-sex sex, that doesn't mean automatically that someone who seeks to gain guidance or insight or even some kind of um, divine experience by engaging with the text has to think, okay, engaging with in same-sex sex today in any context is always wrong. And that's the implicit claim he makes here. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think one of the other reasons that it is such a bad faith argument is because it's leveraging the authority of the Bible, trying to, to assert this, this dichotomous notion that if the Bible says so, that's the end of the story. The Bible approves of things like slavery beginning to end, and people will try to make the case that, oh, it's, it's a more compassionate slavery, it's a better slavery. God is trying to hold their hand incrementally through getting out of slavery. All that is nonsense. The, from beginning to end, slavery is, is never questioned in any way, shape, or form whatsoever, the actual practice itself. We changed our minds over 1,500 years later. Collectively, we got together and we said, nope, this is evil. Mostly collectively, there are still pockets of, of the world and even our own nation where that's not the case. But for the most part, we got together and said, most manifestations of this, we're rejecting as flatly evil. God of the, That's rejecting flatly the perspective of the God of the Bible, Jesus, God, that's flatly saying, we're not, that's not for us anymore. And so people have already negotiated with the text. We've already decided to overrule the text because we got together collectively and said we've changed our minds. And so there is absolutely nothing in or outside of the Bible that precludes us from doing that 
with these outdated, ignorant, scientifically inaccurate notions of, uh, you know, the, the metaphysical contamination caused by same-sex intercourse. And so this is really about trying to defend the maintenance of an identity marker because we choose to do so. This is about trying to leverage the authority of the Bible to authorize a contemporary right-wing authoritarian social dominance orientation identity marker because it is useful for our structuring of power and values and boundaries. And for folks like this, it's obviously uh, useful for their livelihood. They're getting a lot of attention. They're, um, they're probably getting uh, paid, uh, probably not a ton, but they're probably making uh, a decent living trying to share this. Somebody who has that kind of background who now becomes an advocate for a, a conservative Christian perspective is someone who's going to be seen as having a lot of cachet uh, within certain Christian communities. So uh, the, the cognitive scientist of religion in me it can't help but try to uh, see what's what's under the hood here rhetorically, and it seems to me that that this is entirely about trying to defend uh, the use of this identity marker today. And and for that reason, I, I I think that even if it is accurate that Leviticus condemns male same-sex intercourse, that Paul condemns both female and male same-sex intercourse, that does not mean that has any relevance to us today. And I don't think their arguments for the relevance of that rhetoric to us today is particularly convincing. Uh, I think it's it's too mired in dogmas and, uh, and identity politics and fallacious argumentation. Okay, we're going to move ahead to a couple of clips near the end of Lesson 9. So how can we know with certainty that the Bible condemns same-sex sex? When we read scripture in light of its literary context, historical context, and canonical context, it is clear that the Bible condemns same-sex sex. Actually, reading the Bible in light of literary context, historical context, and canonical context is the correct way to interpret any passage in the Bible. If those who have an incorrect interpretation on sexuality actually did this and also submitted to God, the Holy Spirit would do what he does and guide them into truth and the correct interpretation. Like I've heard that claim before from a bunch of different religious groups. If you pray, uh, God will inspire you to know that this is right. If you follow the procedure as we have laid it out, then you will be guided into truth. And um, it's always just special pleading. Uh, like, uh, let's test this. Let's let's gin up some uh, some double blind uh, ways of uh, experimentation to test this and see if people can apply that correctly. And and immediately they'll uh, they'll be like, oh no, they're doing it wrong or, or something like that. There's always an excuse. But uh, that kind of promise at the end of a uh, of a screed like this, I don't think has much much merit to it. I find it strange because I've actually heard this specific apologetic from uh, Dawah guys, like Islamic apologists, more mm -hmm. so than from Christians, because most Muslims, many Muslims believe that the Quran is not just a divinely inspired bit of word. It, it is God's literal word. Yeah. And the evidence of that is that if you dive into it, you hear it recited in its original uh, you know, linguistic form and you understand it, then you will feel Allah with you. It's it's actually kind of similar to the Mormon claim of the burning in the bosom. Yeah. And uh, and so to hear him make the same argument that other quite quite different uh, people with different theologies make is pretty striking to me. I think it's I think it's a manifestation of this notion that this is the experience I had. Therefore, this is the experience that everyone will have. And and that's just not a promise that any of these people is qualified to make. This is the pretty much exact experience that he says he had in prison that, that converted him. So I think you're exactly right about that. He just wants you to replicate his experience, which may be well-meaning, but when you put it like this, it also very much denigrates people like you who are Christian, do care about the text, do care about interpreting it correctly, 
but don't agree with what he says in, <laughs> in, in its entirety. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, returning to the notion that, oh, if you, you apply this, that's the correct way to, to interpret any passage. I would love to see what kind of hermeneutic gymnastics he has to go through to explain away things like slavery, things like uh, the requirement to sacrifice your firstborn child, things like polygamy. There are a ton of different things in the text that, uh, that just can't be made to agree with the dogmas they have about the text. And sure, they have, they have ways to convince themselves that they're right, but uh, when they have to articulate them, uh, it is entertaining to see just how fallacious and just how tortured and problematic their arguments become. I know this was a lot of information, but I'm going to be honest with you. I have an ulterior motive. Sure, I wanted to refute these myths, but I also wanted to give you some tools on how to interpret the Bible for yourself. Many people out there are claiming to be experts. I could claim that you must listen to me because I'm an expert, but I will not do that. As a matter of fact, please don't believe something simply because I said it. I hope you'll listen. I hope you'll take notes, but then open up this book, The Word of God. And if there is anything that I say or anything that an expert might say that contradicts this, do not believe it. This is the word of God, and it is our final authority. I submit myself fully to God and his word. Sola Scriptura. Scripture alone. Ridiculous falsehood. And this is a claim I've made many times. There's no such thing as biblical literalists. And there's no such thing as uh, someone who, who believes in sola scriptura, because ultimately what the authority is, is whatever the tradition insists you must interpret it to mean. Because again, as I mentioned uh, before, you've got a bunch of passages that are just profoundly problematic to this ideology, and so they all get interpreted away. And so ultimately what they are saying is authoritative is their interpretation of the text. And they can't demonstrate that their interpretation is what was originally intended. Frequently, they can't even demonstrate that it's plausible. At best, they can argue, well, you can't prove that my interpretation is impossible. And so they're not solo scripturists, if that's a word. Um, they're, they're sola dogmatists. They're just concerned with, with their tradition, with the dogmas that their tradition insists on. Moving ahead to Lesson 10, where Yuan finally starts directly addressing trans issues. Hooray! Is sex, that is male or female, a social construct? Is it a matter of personal choice? Are there more than two genders? One generation ago, questions like this were unheard of. But today, it's the air we breathe. It's definitely not true that these questions are new, or that any gender besides man or woman is a recent invention. In South Asia, the Hydra, people of a third gender, are known to have existed for thousands of years, and even play an important religious role in the lives of many Hindus. Today, there are a few million Hydra living in India alone. A lot of other cultures have also had other genders for a lot more than just one generation. The Zapotec people of southern Mexico have Muche. Various indigenous cultures in North America have what we now call Two-Spirit. The Bugis people of South Sulawesi, Indonesia have five genders, and a people indigenous to Madagascar have a third gender, which for pronunciation reasons I'll just let you read on the screen. Finally, genders outside of the binary were recorded all the way back in ancient Mesopotamia over 2,000 years BC. Ishtar could uh, flip the gender of male prophets to a specific third gender, a gender that wasn't female but wasn't male. It was a specific Ishtar prophet gender. And we don't know exactly what that entailed, but they grammatically became different. So if questions about sex or gender binaries are new to you, that's okay. Just know that they are not new to humanity. 
what we might call queer, trans, or non-binary people in our culture today have likely always existed, including way, way, way before Christian concepts of gender were ever invented. Sex is an objective binary classification of male or female. Objective means something that's completely independent from personal feelings and self-perceptions. It's an external reality, not subjective. Binary means it has two categories. In this case, the two are male and female. Our sex is not grounded in personal feelings and self-perceptions. It can be confirmed through our biology, in other words, with science. And believe it or not, Christians do believe in science. Science and nature are God's general revelation. Scripture is God's special revelation. General revelation in science will agree with God's special revelation in the Bible. But the world conveniently forgets about science when it comes to transgenderism. Notice that Yuan begins a discussion about the biology of sex, and ultimately means to use that discussion to make a point about being transgender. Yuan doesn't seem to realize that he's talking about two different things here, so his point doesn't actually make any sense. Being trans has to do with gender, how you experience it, how you express it, what roles you play, how people refer to you, and the like. Sex has to do with various biological features in the body. Yuan does not seem to see the distinction here. Sex is an objective external reality. Yet many people today claim that sex is not objective, but arbitrary. Some even contend that sex is assigned at birth. This simply isn't true. The sex of a newborn is not assigned, but observed. It's observed visually, a baby's privates, and genetically through a DNA test. As a matter of fact, parents can even determine the sex of a baby prior to birth. Let's look at the animal kingdom. Do we describe the sex of animals as assigned? Take, for example, puppies. No one arbitrarily assigns sex to puppies. We don't need to ask the puppy or try to discern the puppy's inner thoughts to figure out its sex. That's quite funny to even consider doing this. A male puppy or a female puppy is simply observed. It's actually quite elementary. Next time you hear someone say that sex is assigned, you can clarify that sex is not assigned, but observed. Yuan is again using ideas about biological sex in an attempt to make points about gender and the people who transgress his preferred binary therein. I did a video a little while back where I presented some of the scientific literature behind gender-related psychology and healthcare, and often came across the terms AFAB and AMAB, which stand for assigned female at birth and assigned male at birth, respectively. These terms were used to refer to the biological sex of people who are gender nonconforming. Why not just use male and female here? Well, these words can communicate ideas about biology, but they can also communicate ideas about gender. Unlike some other cultures and languages, ours is still figuring out how to differentiate between the two. If you are a researcher writing about transgender men and you need to refer to their sex, you could say female, but that could mistakenly communicate to the reader that you're referring to people who aren't transgender. What do you do? The solution many people use at the moment is to say assigned female at birth. It's not a claim that sex is arbitrary, or even that it's assigned at birth. It's an attempt to refer to a person's sex without the baggage that female carries in terms of gender. It's still a pretty clunky, somewhat clumsy way of doing so, I think, and a lot of queer people think, but it's what we have right now. The fact that people use this term does not indicate that they are denying that sex exists in any biological way. Yuan just doesn't actually understand this issue. Now the question becomes, is sex truly binary? Is everyone either male or female? What about people who are intersex? Doesn't intersexuality support transgenderism because it proves there are more than two genders? This is faulty in a couple ways. But let me first explain what is intersexuality. 
it is a condition in which an individual's sex organs, hormones, or genetics don't fit into a clear male or female category. It's a condition only occurring in less than one in 2,000 people. That's 0.05% of the population. Doctors know the sex of the vast majority of cases of intersex. It's a myth that the sex of a baby born with intersexuality is unknown. It is discernible after hormonal, genetic, and radiological tests. Even the Intersex Society of North America strongly discourages that children with intersex should be raised as a third gender. So when someone like Yuan brings up the idea that sex is binary in order to actually make a claim about gender, it's become common to retort, intersex people exist. So what does that mean for your understanding of gender? Pointing to the existence of intersex people is not actually an attempt to directly argue for the validity of trans people, but rather an attempt to reveal a flaw in the reasoning that sex is binary, gender is determined by sex, so gender must be entirely binary. Yuan clearly does not understand the rhetorical intent here. Intersex people are born with anatomical features that don't fit a typical binary idea of sex, and actually make up around 1% or maybe a little higher of humans. It's really strange for Yuan to say that the sex of an intersex baby is known, it can be tested. He's implying that intersex people can fit neatly into a sex and gender binary, while intersex literally means does not fit neatly into a binary. So, if there are some people who don't fit into binary sex, and we operate on Yuan's assumption that sex and gender must be synonymous, that means, from Yuan's own perspective, there must be people whose gender does not fit well into a binary. See, pointing to the existence of intersex people is a way to pose an internal critique of Yuan's ideology. Bringing up intersex people can also point to the fact that there are people who are not necessarily trans who must use their own sense of self and personal feelings, not their sex, to determine their gender identity. Specialists do not recommend that parents raise their intersex children as a third gender, but rather recommend parents raise their intersex kids as the gender the kids identify with. Any way you look at it, it seems like gender identity is a real thing we need to take into account. In human biology, when something doesn't fit into known clear categories, we call this an anomaly. So the first point is that anomalies don't erase scientific categories. That would be anti-science. And remember, Christians do believe in science. So Yuan chooses to view intersex as an anomaly rather than a relevant factor in the question of whether or not sex is binary. But doing otherwise is not anti-science. Scientists are constantly arguing about classifications and terminology, and arguing that sex is bimodal rather than binary, as a lot of biologists are doing today, isn't strange or unscientific. Do you know how much debate there is among biologists over what a species is? People argue that a true species doesn't even exist, or that basically every generation of animal is its own species. It gets heated and confusing and just flat out weird in these debates. But that's science for you, always trying to refine ideas, even if it makes things painfully complicated. Science is a kind of philosophy, and the debate about how to describe the sexes is a philosophical one concerned with definitions and classifications. But regardless of how we rather subjectively choose to classify the sexes, doing so doesn't tell us how to think about gender or whether transitioning is good for some people. That is a different matter, concerned with other philosophical ideas and other empirical facts. Yuan conspicuously avoids any real discussion of those facts, though. His discussion of biological sex simultaneously serves to make points about gender and distract from any of the relevant facts about gender with which he cannot contend. It's almost as if all his Moody Bible Institute education prepares him to do is weave fundamentalist Christian narratives without really contending with information inconvenient to him. What follows from here is what he has to say on gender identity and gender dysphoria. What is gender? The modern definition of gender is a very recent invention. You may not know this, but up until recently, the term sex and gender were synonymous. Both meant the objective, 
binary classification of male or female. But this is no longer the case. Instead of referring to the objective binary classification of being male or female, gender is a subjective self-perception of viewing oneself as male or female. Remember earlier when I said that objective means something that is completely independent from personal feelings and self-perceptions? Subjective is the opposite. It means something that is completely dependent on personal feelings and self-perceptions. It's an internal experience, thus not objective. The modern notion of gender doesn't point to anything tangible. It's purely based on a person's self-perception and nothing else. In the mainstream of our Western English-speaking culture, yes, sex and gender have been considered synonymous for a while. As discussed earlier, this is not the case for all of human culture. Just because an idea or concept is new to our cultural mainstream, does that automatically make it invalid? Of course it doesn't. Any idea must stand or fall based upon its validity and utility, not its novelty. With the claim that the modern definition of gender points to nothing tangible, Yuan attempts to argue that identifying with a gender other than the one he believes is defined by your sex is invalid. Gender identity is tied to observable patterns in human psychology, though. Gender nonconforming people very often identify as such from childhood, reporting that they don't just want to be the gender they identify with, but vividly feel they already are. This can occur without them even knowing of the existence of other gender nonconforming people. When not treated as their gender identity by others, they typically develop extreme distress and even suicidal ideation. Research shows that gender affirmation through social support and sometimes medical interventions remedies this effectively. Most importantly, no intervention, whether religious, psychological, or medical, has ever been shown to successfully and reliably change a person's perception of self such that they consistently report feeling like a gender different than the one with which they previously identified. Put simply, gender identity can't be purposely changed. It affects how we want to be treated, and feels so profoundly incongruent with non-affirming treatment that severe distress predictably results. That seems tangible enough to me. Yet, right now, this subjective and psychological self-perception of gender is being forced on others through language. Individuals are enforced to use pronouns that aren't preferred, but kind of mandated, along with newly chosen names matching self-perception rather than objective truth. I find this point really funny coming from someone who was adamant that I not call him ex-gay, but rather a guy who formerly identified as gay. He's alright with forcing language on others when it suits him, I guess. I can't fault him too much for that though, because aren't we all okay with that? Don't all of us have names and prefer to be called by that name or even a specific variation of it? My legal first name is Andrew, but since I was about five, I've demanded to be called Drew. Literally no one has ever complained about me forcing anything on them as a result, and why would they? Calling someone what they prefer is already a regular, easy cultural custom. It's not that big of a deal. By refusing to call a gender nonconforming person by their preferred name and pronouns, Yuan does just as much forcing as anyone else. This act of his, which he believes has to do with making a statement about objective truth, smuggles the premise that sex and gender are synonymous into every conversation with or about a queer person. Just as Yuan might find it insulting that someone else would identify differently than he wants and ask him to respect that, Queer people might find it insulting that he insists on effectively communicating you're delusional and your identity is beneath respect, with every interaction. Being asked to address people how they want to be addressed is not persecution. Stop acting like it is. This persecution act is especially ridiculous when there is actual scientific research that demonstrates that non-affirming treatment of queer people is directly linked to higher rates of depression and suicide for them. Meanwhile, being asked to respect others' names and pronouns is not linked to any negative outcomes at all. So you tell me, who really has the raw end of the deal here? Given that sex is objective 
and gender is subjective, you'd think we'd value conforming subjective thoughts to objective truth. Instead, the opposite is true. Our culture now values altering physical bodies to accommodate subjective self-perceptions. For most, self-perception aligns with biological sex. For a small percentage, their self-perception does not align with their biological sex. This mental distress is called gender dysphoria, which, to be clear, is a psychological consequence of the fall. The truth of the matter is that our internal subjective sense of self, that is gender, doesn't describe who we are, but how we are. People in our culture who value affirming gender nonconforming people do so because that is what actual scientific research suggests leads to the best physical and mental health outcomes for those people. There's no way to demonstrate that gender dysphoria is a result of the fall. The biblical fall of man itself can't even be demonstrated objectively. It's pretty reasonable then to treat gender identity in a way which we can observe leads to the best outcomes. Fundamentalists like Yuan and my former self get so wrapped up in mythological stories that they act as if the subjective moral narrative of those stories predicts objective, observable outcomes of specific actions today. If gender dysphoria is a result of the fall of man, then calling it sinful and trying to suppress it must get the best results, they think. If this turns out not to be true, that is ignored. Meaningful stories for them come before anything else, even the readily observable well-being of others. In Lesson 3, we discussed how Genesis 1 verse 27 conveys an undeniable connection between the image of God and sex, male and female. I showed you all how this verse consists of three parallel lines of poetry. This communicates that there is a close connection between being created in the image of God and being male and female. Just as being created in the image of God is physical, spiritual, and essential to being human, being male or female is physical, spiritual, and essential to who we are. Sex can't be changed by human hands. It's a category of God's handiwork, his original and everlasting design. As hard as anyone may try to alter this fact in his or her own body, the most that can be done is to artificially remove or add body parts or use pharmaceuticals to unnaturally suppress the biological and hormonal reality of one's essence as male or female. Trying to alter this God-given physical and spiritual reality of being male or female, can have grave and lasting effects. See what I mean? Yuan literally uses an ancient poem to demonstrate that we are either male or female in such a transcendent way that transitioning so that your appearance aligns more with your gender identity must be harmful. The fact is, we just don't observe this in reality. I'll reiterate. Affirmation and social acceptance, hormone therapy, and certain surgeries for the portion of trans people who want them have been scientifically shown to be highly efficacious in improving the mental health of trans people. You can interpret poetry however you want, but it's hard to interpret the scientific data in a way that suggests that refusing to affirm trans people is actually good for them. I have a very in-depth video which goes over the research I just mentioned, so if you're interested, it's linked in the description. As Christians living today in perplexing times, we must recognize the world confuses and conflates sex, gender, and norms. Ultimately, we need to realize that transgenderism is not exclusively a battle for what is male or female. It is a battle for what is truth. Our culture tells us, you are what you feel, but truth is not based on subjective experience. The truth of being male or female is rooted in the objective reality of who God created us to be in his own image. Yet because we're all fallen, our feelings and self-perceptions cannot be trusted. Because of the fall, 
I cannot blindly trust my feelings and thoughts. So I must take every thought captive to obey Christ. We can't trust our own perceptions, and that's why we shouldn't accept our own feelings of queerness. Okay, but doesn't this idea cut both ways? Yuan's own conversion story, especially when learning about sexuality in the Bible, hinges on his personal perception of the Holy Spirit convicting him. Later, he says if we get right with God, we can feel the Holy Spirit guiding us as we interpret scripture, which gives us certainty. If people can't trust their own perceptions, Yuan's heart could have been deceiving him when he was in prison reading about sexuality in the Bible. It could have also been totally leading him astray on his interpretation of the Bible, blasphemously deceiving him into thinking his own heart was actually the Holy Spirit. Why should queer people doubt their perceptions while Yuan gets to trust his and even attribute them to God himself? Ultimately, I know why. It's because this is part of the grand narrative that is Christian fundamentalism. The in-group is good. We have all the answers. We can be trusted. The out-group is bad. They're confused and deceitful. Why is this? Because we appeal to an ultimate authority and they don't. If you see any problems with this, if we appear in any way hypocritical, just realize that is really a problem with you. Okay, I'm sure that by now you see the pattern here and don't need yet more explanation. Luckily, I can end my response here. There are two more lessons, but they just give mundane practical advice for speaking to LGBT people and creating a routine of reading the Bible, so I'm going to skip them. To conclude, I'll just remind you of a few points I made throughout my response. This program of sexual ethics, like typical conversion therapy programs, seek to convince you that you're sick or disordered and then try to sell you the cure. You might pay with money, but you also might pay in allegiance or submission to their authority. Yuan did not contend with any actual rigorous research on sexuality, orientation, or gender, which largely disagrees with him. All he did was weave a narrative which implied that he was both spiritually and scientifically correct. Yuan did claim that conversion from same-sex attraction to opposite-sex attraction is possible within his program of sexual ethics. This is a claim of faith healing. This program is set up to protect itself, always blaming the person participating in it for failing so they won't question any of the program's narratives. This can lead to dependence on an abusive authority. Yuan seeks to distance himself from ex-gay ministries, as their reputation of failure is well known. Regardless, Yuan's program has quite a bit in common with these ministries. This program seeks out young people. They are vulnerable to indoctrination through storytelling, unsubstantiated claims, and appeals to authority. They are also too young to have already been influenced by knowledge of the calamitous history of past ex-gay ministries. This makes them easy to reach for this program. I'm glad I eventually escaped the fundamentalist mindset on sexuality, but countless young people are still being groomed into submission, suppression, and denial through programs like these. Conversion practices like this still have so much power and funding behind them that a recent systematic review estimates that around 10% of LGBT people have experienced them. To combat this, educate yourself on how conversion practices work, what motivates them, and how religious institutions keep them alive. Then speak out to expose them for the abusive scams they are. I hope this video can help people do that. I highly recommend the book Lies with a Straight Face by longtime LGBT activist Wayne Besson. It details the insane, disgusting, and criminal history of the ex-gay industry from the perspective of someone who has been at the forefront of the fight against it for decades. This book inspired this video, so thank you, Wayne, for your work. And thank you for watching this massively long video. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. A special thanks to my patrons for their constant love and support. I could not do huge videos like this without them. If you want to hear more from me, then subscribe. As always, if you are an apostate in need, there are resources linked in the description to help you find community and mental health support. Remember to be kind to others in the comments, and until next time, stay skeptical.